Hey guys, good evening. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be able to lead you in the study of God's Word. My name is Chris Moody and I'm a seminary student at RTS Jackson and just delighted to be with you um, virtually. You know, for some, for some people you might be thinking, man, ugh, you know, here we go again. It's back, back to normal, which is kind of sad to think that being back to normal is watching church online. But the good news is, the good news is that even in a season like this, the Word of God is still faithful. It's still existing. God's still working through it, and He's working in our hearts, whether we're in church together or you know, whether we're at home worshiping with our families. Uh, this evening, we're going to be looking at one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. It comes from Psalm 103. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5, and it's a psalm of great confidence, a psalm of great assurance um, and really a, really a psalm of hope. And as we, as we study it this evening, what we're going to see is a beautiful reality that worshiping leads to remembering. David comes before the Lord in this psalm and he stirs all of his being and all that he is to worship God. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. But then something interesting happens. David goes on to call his soul to worship God, and then he says, Soul, forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. And what David begins to do is he begins to explore what it means to be in a personal covenant relationship with God, that God is drawn near to be with David, and that being in a relationship with a kind and good God means that God has done several things for us, that he has looked after our souls, he has seen them, and he has met our deepest needs. And so what we're going to look at this evening is that worshiping leads to remembering. So let's read this passage together, and then we'll pray and ask for God's help. We're in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. This is God's word. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Well, the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Oh God, you've been so good to us. You've been so good to us to give, you your, to give us your word. Lord, your word always accomplishes its purpose, even in a time like this, even now. So we would trust that truth. We would trust that promise. And Lord, I would pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, that he would cultivate good soil within it, that your word might go down, that it might take root and produce fruit. Oh, Lord, now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts collectively would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer. Oh, God, we pray that we would see Jesus. We would see him in his glory. And Lord, we just pray all these things in his name, for his glory. Amen. Well, if you've got kids or you know, you're, you're a grandparent, you've got grandkids, or maybe you're just a grown-up kid like me, you've probably seen the movie Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo is a movie about a little fish who gets swept away in a current and he gets lost from his dad. And his dad, Marlon, goes on a rescue mission to try and find Nemo. And along his journey, he picks up a traveling companion named Dory who goes along with him. And there's a really interesting scene where they find a sunken piece of shipwreckage at the bottom. And, you know, there's, a, there's an anglerfish trying to eat them, you know. And so Marlin creates a diversion, goes off and distracts this predator fish. And Dory looks at this wreckage and sees an address on it. And she tries to sound it out and get it. And she finally does, and it's P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. And so they escape from the anglerfish and they get away. And the next scene, the next scene begins with Dory constantly speaking this address to herself. She's saying, P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. And she's just harassing herself with this address, and it's almost kind of annoying. But what we come to find out is that Dory has a condition 
called short-term memory loss. She's got short-term memory loss, and Dory knows that if for a second she doesn't repeat this address to herself, she's in danger of forgetting it. And so she constantly reminds herself of it because she knows how important this address is to their mission, and that if they forget it, if she forgets it, they may not be able to find Nemo. Friends, I think, I think if we stop and think for a second, as Christians, we have short-term gospel memory loss. I think we do. I think it's so easy for us to, you know, we come into worship or, you know, our own private worship, and we dwell on the goodness and the reality, you know, of what God has done for us. But then we, you know, we get distracted. We get into the busyness of life. You know, we, we get into the Thanksgiving holidays and the things come, and we just... It's so easy for us to forget what God has done for us. You know, maybe you're worried about the dishes, you know, you're going to cook, you know, for these holiday seasons. You're worried about family coming in town. I don't know. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's going on. But the reality and the, the truth that we need to remember this morning is this, that you and I, we need to remember the gospel. We need to remember the kindness of God towards his people, what God has done for us. And I think David gets this reality because he says, look at me back at verse 2. After he calls all of his soul to worship God and to bless the holy name of the Lord, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he says something really interesting. He says, forget not all his benefits. Why? Because David knows it's so easy for our souls to forget the kindness of God towards us. And so what we see this morning is this, this pattern that as we come before God to worship God, we begin to remember and reflect on his goodness and his kindness towards us. And this passage calls us to remember four really key things. David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he remembers four key benefits, that he forgives all your iniquity, so he forgives us. He heals all your diseases, he heals us. He redeems your life from the pit. He is our redeemer. And fourth, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Worshiping leads to remembering that he forgives us, that he heals us, that he redeems us, and that he loves us. So first, he forgives all your iniquity. You know, it's interesting that when David begins to ponder the blessings that he has, in a relationship with God. The first thing he doesn't think about is, you know, God, thank you so much for making me king. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And soul, for, you know, don't forget all the good things he's given us. He's given us a kingdom. He's given me a wife. He's given me all of these, these things. He's given me a family, you know, or maybe in your case, he's given you a great career or maybe a challenging one. And he doesn't say that. The first thing that David remembers as he remembers that God forgives all his iniquity. If you're a Bible highlighter or a Bible underliner, I would really encourage you, circle that word, all your iniquity. Because what David realizes is that God, in his kindness, hasn't just forgiven some of his iniquity. He hasn't just forgiven the big sins or the little sins and then said, okay, David, now, now you go out there and try really good and, and try, you know, don't, don't sin anymore because, you know, my forgiveness is going to run out at some point. No, David remembers that if I am in a relationship with God, then that means God has considered my soul, that he has seen all of my sin, he has seen all of my brokenness, and he has moved towards me to forgive me of all of it. Believer in Jesus this evening, you have been forgiven of all of your iniquity. And this forgiveness has, is, he has a twofold reality. It's that it is a completed forgiveness. It's a forgiveness of both your past, your present, and your future sins, but it's also continual. Um, you know, when God forgives us of all of our sins, he doesn't only forgive the past or only forgive the present. And then he's unsure about your future. No, God forgives all of your iniquity. Because if he knows your soul and he has considered your life, he has seen every single one of the sins you have committed, you will commit, and that you are even struggling with even right now. And he said, I've seen it all, and I'm willing to forgive it all. 
by sending my only son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross, to die for your sins, while I put all of the sin of all of my people onto Jesus. And he will be crucified there, and he will die to pay for your sins so that you can draw near and be forgiven. Friends, you serve a God that longs to forgive you. So it's completed. He's, com- he's forgiven all of your iniquity. You're never going to sin and take God by surprise. But it's also continual because one of, the, one of the realities of Scripture is that God is always calling his people to continually come before him and confess their sins. First uh, John says, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a call. Matthew Henry says it this way. As we keep on sinning, God keeps on forgiving. Now, he's not saying, you know, we have a license to sin, you know, because Paul says, you know, shall we sin, go on sinning, that grace may abound, may it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? But Scripture understands that when we come in a relationship with God, when God saves us, when God forgives us of all of our sins, we still have an ongoing struggle and a battle against sin. There's still that Romans 7 struggle, you know, where Paul is wrestling against his flesh and he describes that as, you know, doing what he doesn't want to do and struggling to do what he wants to do. But Jesus commands us and calls us, come and confess your sins to me. Come daily, come often and do so. As we keep on sinning, he keeps on forgiving. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, when the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. What is one of the things that Jesus actually commands us to pray? He says, pray, forgive us our debts. Now, this is interesting because this is the Savior of the world. This is the King of the world. This is God saying, Christian, believer, draw near to me and ask for forgiveness. Friends, you serve a God who loves to forgive you. I heard somebody say one time that God loves to forgive you more than you love to sin. He loves to forgive you more than you love to sin. And you might be thinking, what? God hates sin. Yes, he does. He is a holy God and he hates sin, but he also loves those who he has saved. So much so that he loves in his kindness and he loves in his mercy to show us forgiveness. And his love to forgive you is so much greater than your love to sin. So Christian, Draw near. Confess your sins. I don't know what you're struggling with this evening, but I know this. God has seen all of your sin and he has seen all of your struggle and he says, I have forgiven you. So draw near and confess your sins. The doors are open. He will forgive you. He will continually do so. You know, I think about the disciples when they say, Jesus, you know, how often should we forgive our brother when he sins against us? Seven times? Like is, is, is that enough? You know, I mean, that's a, that's a lot, Jesus. You know, seven times, you know, I might get tired of doing it after that. And Jesus says, he says something. He says, no, forgive him 70 times seven. And I think that's a complete, you know, it's a complete number. It's, an, it's a number that says, hey, no matter how many times they sin against you, keep on forgiving because I will never stop forgiving you. Friends, that is the reality that we find ourselves in this evening. A God who has considered the needs of your soul and he knows all of your iniquity and he has chosen in Christ Jesus to die for those sins and to forgive you. Rest in that. Remember that. But secondly, so he forgives all your iniquity, but he also heals all your diseases. Now, I think certainly... The reality, you know, what Scripture teaches is that God is the healer of all of our, you know, all of our sickness. But I think as David is preaching, to, you know, and speaking to his own soul, well, I think what he has in mind here is that God has considered the deepest and the greatest disease of the soul. And the greatest disease of the soul is not COVID. It's not cancer. Even those things, those things do weigh us down. Those things are, you know, deep and painful trials. But the disease of the soul, the greatest disease of the soul, the disease that wants to destroy you, 
is sin. And when David realizes that if God has considered the needs of my soul, if he has considered my sin and he has forgiven all of my sin, then he has also begun the process of healing me of my greatest disease, of the disease of the sin, the greatest sickness of the soul, which is sin. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, when, you know, when the first sin happened, where do we find God? We find God coming into the Garden of Eden, and he says, Adam and Eve, where are you? You know, and they're, they're hiding off in the bushes. They're hiding away from God. And God draws near to them, and he calls them out. And then what does he do? After he announces the curses, you know, for their disobedience, he says, I'm going to send a Savior, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And the reality that we find in this passage is this, that if, if God has forgiven all of your iniquity, if he has healed you, if he has, you know, if he has justified you, which is you know, declaring you righteous, if he has saved you from your sin, then he has also begun the process of sending his Holy Spirit to work in your life, to free you from that sin day in and day out by the Holy Spirit working within you. That is how he heals you, and sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it hurts really bad, and sometimes we, sometimes we don't even want it. But Jesus says, I love you too much. I've considered the disease of your soul so much. And I know it wants to destroy you. I know it's sickening. I know that it's latched onto you, that it's contaminating you. And he says, I'm going to send the Spirit to work in your heart to begin to rid you of that sin so that I can heal you. I read a little book one time called My Heart Cries Home. And it's really short. It's like 12 pages um, but in it, it, it describes, you know, a relationship with a man with Jesus, and, and it describes the heart of man as, as a home. And so this guy invites Jesus into his life, and he shows Jesus all around the house. He shows them, you know, the kitchen, the living room, and all of these places. And so they begin to have this relationship where Jesus is living in his house, and they're abiding together. But an interesting thing happens. Jesus comes to the owner of the house and he says, friend, you know, I've been living with you for a while, but there is this really bad smell coming from the end of the hall. There's this room that you haven't turned over to me. There's this room where, you know, there's this really bad smell coming out. And he says, friend, I can't keep living here. And the guy says, I knew what Jesus was talking about. He knew he was talking about that closet where the, you know, those, his deep sins were. And he said, I didn't want Jesus to take those. I didn't want Jesus to open that closet. I didn't want Jesus to go in there because I loved it and I wanted to keep it. And Jesus says, friend, I love you too much for that. Give me the keys. Let me unlock that closet. Let me go in there. Let me work in there and clean it up. And so the man gives him the keys, and Jesus goes in, and he unlocks the closet, and he begins to clean it out and pull those sins out. Y'all, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He's not content to, to dwell in us and to leave sin in there as well. No, his desire is to go in and to cleanse us, to heal us, to clean us up. And that's what he does throughout your whole life, that if God has saved you, as we've seen, if he's forgiven all of your iniquity, then he's also going to work in your life to heal you of all of those diseases as the Holy Spirit begins his work of cleaning you up and cleaning it out. Y'all, sometimes it really hurts, but friends, it's good. Remember and rest in that reality that if you've been forgiven, then you are also being healed. And sometimes, you know, it's easy for us to think, man, God's not at work. I'm struggling so much with this sin. I'm so broken. I'm hurting so bad. This, this sickness has afflicted me for so long. But here's the truth, that if God has saved you, then no matter how you feel, no matter the brokenness, no matter the pain, no matter the suffering, Jesus is at work in your life. And he's promised that. Whether you feel it or not, you can rest in the reality that he has forgiven you of all your iniquity, but he's also, by the power of his Holy Spirit at work in your life, healing you of all your diseases. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. But look with me at verse 4. He says he redeems your life from the pit. He redeems your life from the pit. He's seen your soul. 
He's seen the sickness. He's seen the sin and he has forgiven it. But he has forgiven it how? By Jesus saying, I'm going to be your redeemer. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm actually, by my own blood, I'm going to buy you back from the sin that desired to destroy you. I'm going to buy you back from it. I'm actually going to purchase your life with my own blood. And so Jesus comes to this earth and he lives a perfect life and he perfectly obeys the law. And then he goes to the cross and he sheds his blood for your soul to redeem you. The God who has seen your sin, the God who has seen your soul and the deepest needs of it says, I am gonna save your soul by sending my only son to go to the cross and to die for you. Because that is the state we found ourselves in. We, We were desperate, we needed somebody to come and die for us because we couldn't save ourselves. Remember when Adam and Eve took took of the fruit and they ate, God had commanded them not to do that. And he said, in the day that you eat of it, what will happen? You will surely die. Y'all, sin doesn't play games. For sinners like us, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And all of us find ourselves in that place. That when we're born into this world, we're born into a world of sin. We're born with a sin nature. We're born guilty and convicted before God as sinners. And we're on a path. We're on, you know, we're walking and running straight towards, straight towards hell. Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But what? But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul says it this way. He says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, you know, following the prince of the power of the air. We were running wholeheartedly after sin. We were chasing, oh, we, we were running away from God. But in that moment, God said, yes, but I'm gonna run towards them. And so Jesus comes. Jesus doesn't stand back. Jesus doesn't stay away and say, well, they've helplessly lost their way. We can't do anything. No, Jesus says, I love my people so much that I'm actually going to go to the earth. I'm going to take on flesh. I'm going to dwell among them. I'm going to walk among them. I'm going to heal their diseases. I'm going to touch them. I'm going to feel their brokenness. And then I'm going to go to the cross and bear all of their sin so that I can save them. I read a story. um, It happened back in 2010. In, uh, in Chile, there was a group of miners who, you know, were working deep below the earth in a mine, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> a rock from the top of the mine broke loose, and it brought the entire mine down on these miners, and they were trapped. There was nothing they could do. They couldn't dig their way out. They couldn't break through. They couldn't, you know, there was no amount of effort that they could do to get themselves out of being trapped within that mine. Until one day, a rescue team was able to penetrate through the darkness. They were able to break through and they were able to get down, deep down in there, and save those miners. And after, I think, a period of about 69 days, all of these guys were brought to the surface and they were saved. There was nothing they could do. There was no way they could dig their ways out. They were helpless down there. Friends, that's the place we find ourselves. Outside of Christ, as sinners, we're desperate. We're doomed. We're we're trapped within our sin. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. But what does Paul go on to say? But God, being rich in mercy, according to the great love with which he loved us, that even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together in Christ Jesus. By grace, you have been saved. And it's not of yourselves. No amount of working, no amount of doing, no amount of striving and trying can save yourself. You're desperate. That's where we need to find ourselves this evening. Desperate and in need of Jesus. And the beauty of this passage is we remember that not only has he forgiven all of our iniquity, not only has he sent the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to heal us of the greatest disease of the soul, which is sin, but he has also sent Jesus to redeem us from the death that was gonna overcome us. He redeems your life from the pit. 
And then fourthly and lastly, look with me at verse four. He says, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Y'all, why does he do what he does? Why does God draw near to sinners? Why does God desire to come in and to forgive all of our iniquity, to put his Holy Spirit to work in us, to, to heal us of all of our diseases, and to send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to redeem us by his own blood? Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you so much. He says he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Paul says in Romans 5 eight, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, that's the good news. That's the gospel. That while we were sinners, while we were outcasts, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us because he loves you. And he has crowned you with that steadfast love. If you're a believer in Jesus this evening, you live and you dwell with the love of God crowning your head. Spurgeon in his Treasury of David says that the crown, you know, the crown that Christians wear is not an earthly crown of jewels, it's not an earthly crown of precious metal, but it is the crown of the steadfast love and the mercy of God. That's what you wear on your head. He crowns you with it. When you're in Christ, when you've been saved, when you've been redeemed, you have been crowned with the steadfast love of God. And what that means is this, that there is not a moment or a day that goes by that the steadfast love of God is not placed on your head, that his love is not pursuing you, that his love is not with you. You may not feel that this evening. You may feel forsaken. You may feel like, man, I've been struggling with this sin for so long. There's no way God loves me. Maybe he's going to quit loving me at some point. Maybe he's going to turn his back on me because I've so often turned my back on God. How can I know he still loves me? I had a friend say one time, he said, if you ever doubt the love of God, if you ever find yourself wondering, can God really love me? Does he really love me? He said, all you need to do is look at the cross. Because on the cross, the Son of God said, I love my people so much that I'm willing to go to the farthest extent, to the deepest depth, to the most broken, loneliest place on the face of this earth so that I can save my people. Because I love them. Because I want them. And so he goes to the cross and on the cross, he dies. Why? Because for the joy set before him, the gospel says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Friend, that joy was you. That joy was me. He went all the way to the cross for you. And friends, if he will pursue you in your brokenness as an enemy all the way to the cross to redeem you and save you, then he's never going to quit loving you. David says in Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Believer in Jesus, if you have been saved, if you have been forgiven, if you have been redeemed, God will never stop loving you. Remember, Paul says in Romans 8, he says that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, son, of his Son. And those whom he foredo, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he what? He also glorified. If he has saved you, he is going to pursue you and love you all the way to the end. And he's going to bring you safely home. I don't know where you find yourself this evening. I don't know maybe the anxiety in which you're, you find yourself as you get ready for Thanksgiving. Maybe this year somebody's not going to be there that's always been there. Maybe there's been a tragic loss in your family. But friend, the reality is this. No matter what you're going to be facing, this is the gospel that you can remember. This is the gospel that is for you. I read a story one time about a guy named Horatio Spafford. Um, he actually lost all of his children in a tragic ship fire. But out of that brokenness, he wrote one of, the most, one of the most beloved hymns that we still sing to this day. And it's called, It Is Well With My Soul. You can imagine the pain and the sorrow that he felt as... 
he received the news that his children had died. But then he penned these words, and friend, only a believer can write these. This is what he says. He says something so beautiful and so profound. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and he shed his blood for my soul. And then listen to what he says. He says, my sin, oh, the bliss. Oh, this glorious thought that my sin, remember, he forgives all your iniquity. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it. No more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I don't know what you're struggling with this evening. I don't know the pain. I don't know the brokenness. But Jesus does. And friend, he has considered your soul and he loves it so much that he has shed his own blood for it. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Y'all, this is what renews and satisfies our soul. So my question for you this evening is this. Do you know this Jesus? Would you come to him? Would you trust in him? Would you bring all of your sin, all of your brokenness, all of your worry? Because he has considered your soul and he knows it and he loves you. Would you come to him for the first time or the thousandth time? That's an invitation. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for considering our souls. Lord, thank you for coming and drawing near to us in our brokenness. God, even in a season like this when we're so insecure, when we don't know what's going on, God, you have drawn near to be with us. God, because you love us. Will we remember that during these holidays? Will we remember your grace and your kindness towards us in Christ Jesus? Will we trust in you? Will we rest in you? the Savior and the lover of sinners like us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.